Well, let's get started into our, our message today on the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, for those of you who are just brand new, first time watching, perhaps, you might want to go back and watch the previous five weeks. We've been a, this is the sixth week of a series, and I want to just lay the, the really critical foundation. Just because we come to the end of a series on the Holy Spirit, we want you to take this information, this truth, and begin to apply it into your life day by day and surrendering to the Holy Spirit. So I want to encourage you to know that just because a series ends doesn't mean that this isn't valuable. Keep your pursuit. And so in the course of our journey, we have looked at the fact that the Holy Spirit is, in fact, God who dwells in us which is a critical understanding. He is not some impersonal force. He is present, he is personal, and he is interactive in our lives. And so I wanna make sure you have that foundation. That's why I'm not gonna unpack the last five weeks, but I am gonna bring us to a critical, uh, I think, juncture to understand what it means to truly live with the understanding and awareness of the Holy Spirit. And so if you open up to Acts chapter one, I wanna encourage you, if you have your Bible to do that or open your app so you can become familiar with where God's word is and how it's laid out, it's just, it's good for you to do that. It's good to highlight and circle things that, that, that the Spirit perhaps brings to an awareness. So uh, I'm gonna put it on the screen though for you as well so you can follow along on the screen, but I would encourage you to open your Bibles to Acts chapter one. And so here we have, of course, the story uh, of the disciples and how Jesus interacted with the disciples in Acts, as well as after Jesus ascended into heaven, how then the Holy Spirit moved through the disciples uh, to bring us to where we are today. So uh, starting in verse six, it says this. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, Will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? They wanted this so bad. They knew that this was the hope that they had been given since Abraham. But he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Yeah, sorry, that's not what I'm gonna be talking about today. And so what he does is he says this in verse eight. He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And when he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up. Can you imagine, just pause, that you've seen now the resurrected Jesus. He's standing, he's talking to you and he says, Man, I am going away. Remember that I'm going, but I'm going to give you something beautiful. I'm going to give you the power of God in you, the Holy Spirit. And so they're watching and he gets lifted into heaven and it says, and on a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into the heavens as he went, I'm sure they stared for a long time, like a good friend going away on a car or an airplane till the last speck is gone. They were gazing into heaven and behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? I think it's almost as if to say, why are you still looking? Didn't he tell you, you have, you have this great opportunity to go and proclaim the gospel? Why are you still looking? But he said this, this Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. And we, as followers of Christ, we hold to that truth that Jesus will return and it will be very well known. It will not be just a Facebook post. <laughs> it won't show up in just some kind of thread. You and I, here, there, wherever you're watching from, it will be very aware and obvious when his return is here. So, so we look forward to that, that he's coming back, that God has a plan and he will continue that plan. But I want you to focus today on this truth that was just spoken in the book of Acts is that you will receive power. You will receive power. Have you ever thought about what it would be like to have power? Like the strength, perhaps, the strength of people that, that receive the Spirit, the strength that says you've got power to push over these, these big old pillars. As Samson received power over him. Or maybe 
You wish you had great wisdom like Solomon, the power to know immense things. Have you ever wondered what it would be like or asked about that? And, and I believe that we all come to Christ the same way on our knees and our hearts just broken. But when we come and he, he says, welcome, welcome to my kingdom, we also bring with us luggage. We bring bags full of different theologies. And then the Holy Spirit says, now I want to help unpack those bags. And so, so I want to present to you something that I brought into my life as I was first a believer. And, and this is my gravy boat genie. I couldn't find a good genie one, but I want to make the point that, that I grew up watching TV shows like uh, Bewitched or I Dream of Genie or Aladdin cartoons. And, and I was always fascinated with the idea if I rubbed the lamp three times, out would come the genie and that genie said, whatever you wish. And so usually you get the three wishes, Right. And of course, if you're brilliant like me, you said, oh, easy, first wish, million unlimited wishes. Like more wishes than I could ever use up would be my first wish. And then I would solve the problem of needing the genie anymore. I got all the wishes I need. And the second one, of course, would be something to benefit me now. What would I do? What, how would I use the power to benefit me? And so oftentimes it would be fame or riches. And then, of course, the typical uh, response at the pageant to end world peace. Or not to end, sorry. <laughs> How about to bring world peace? <laughs> that, whole, that whole idea is it would be great to have it, so don't think that wouldn't be a great wish. But honestly, to bring world peace would be so I could receive the glory for it. So people could say, how did it happen? And I would say, me, I had the genie, and I rubbed the lamp, and I got the wishes, and yeah, now you can thank me. See, what I realize is that that genie theology is no different than a lot of how we approach God when we come to him new and fresh. That when we're young in our faith, we, we think we should have power to manipulate God for my kingdom and for my glory. And so people have been on this journey since the Garden of Eden. People have tried things through meditation and through potions, standing in certain poses, reciting certain rituals, sorcery, witchcraft, songs, all kinds of things that we do with the purpose to activate some kind of supernatural power for my kingdom and for my glory. And so now we're confronted with a problem. We have the power in us, and now we wrestle with that. Then how do I access it, and for what reason? And today I want to unpack that idea. How do I access this power, and for what reason? And look at what it says back to Acts. It says, you will receive power. This is a promise when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. This is important. That power has a purpose, and that purpose is not for your kingdom. It is for the kingdom of God and for his glory, and so that you can witness that, so you can share that in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And I just want to pause for a moment, and I want to celebrate something that, that we often don't say, and we're really cautious to for this reason, because we have been called to share the gospel. You and I, as followers of Jesus, we've been called to be witnesses where we live, where we work, where we play, and to the ends of the earth. And here's something really exciting. Like the ripples in a pond, when the gospel was first delivered, as it first went out with the, in this book of Acts story, as these disciples and believers were empowered with the Holy Spirit, the ripple effects of that have reached today the ends of the earth. Just think about that for a moment. In every nation, every geographic location, there are now believers. The, the gospel is being spread. Now, if you just celebrated and said, oh, great, we're done. Eh, not yet. Okay, so not every people group has been reached. There's still work to do, but just picture that in this little tiny geographic area of Israel, from that out came the gospel. And now we're in the phase in which it's now bouncing back. The, think of a pond and the ripples hit the edge of the pond and then they reflect back toward its center. The gospel 
and the power that's in us has been going out. We still have work to do, but so what is that power? Let me ask you, do you understand what this means? Well, let's just unpack for a moment when it said you will receive power. It says this. One, you receive the same power inside you that raised Christ from the dead. That's power, and that's in you now. You have the power of the God of the universe who created all things, everything that was created. This is the all-knowing God, the all-present has existed forever and will exist forever. This is the perfect judge, the power of the perfect judge and the power of the holy God who is perfect in all things. That resides in you and the Holy Spirit. That's why we say when you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have God in you. And so the challenge is, if I have the power in me, then how does it best become displayed? And it's not through rubbing a genie lamp. It's not through the right posture of your body or the right words in which you speak. I want to unpack why and how. And I want you to start here because this gets confusing. See, we have a good father. And he is so gracious that he, he gives us this power in us. But he says, that power will give you benefits. There will be personal benefits that you and I receive, but the receiving of those benefits is not the purpose. But I want to start there, that you will receive the power for your benefit. There are good things that come into our life when we surrender our life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit dwells in us. We receive great benefit from that. Look what it says in John 16. It says, nevertheless, Jesus telling again, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage or your benefit, depending on the translation that you're reading from. It's to your advantage or your benefit that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. It's, it's to your benefit that you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. There's there's elements of this that are so critical we've got to hold on to. First one is, I have four actually I want to walk through. The first one is just salvation. Like it's to your benefit you're going to receive the Holy Spirit. We talked about this, this guarantee, the, the seal placed upon you guaranteeing your inheritance. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, you receive that benefit. This believing faith that that the Holy Spirit helped me to believe even. It's for my salvation. Two, the fruit of the Spirit. We just, we just got done talking about that two weeks ago in Galatians 5, this idea that the fruit of the Spirit that's in you, the fullness of the fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, when you begin to live out of that and experience it, you do receive benefit of experiencing true peace in your life. Who's not looking for peace? Be honest. We're all looking for that. Who doesn't want to be loved? And you, you receive the fullness of that in you because God is love. His love is in you. And then in Romans chapter 8, there's this, this concept that he intercedes for us. There is this, there can be some confusion, and I don't want to unpack this passage, but I also think it's very clear. When you don't know what to do or what to pray, the Holy Spirit intercedes if he's in you, he gives you the words. He gives you the, the, the desires of God's heart that are in your heart. He helps you in that journey of intercession because he's near to you. He's personal. He's active in your life. And then, of course, the fourth benefit is he reveals truth. And this is a critical passage in John that he guides us to truth and guides us to hear the truth that the Father wants us to hear reveals truth. It, the Holy Spirit reveals the words of Jesus when we're not sure where to go or what to say. It, it reveals truth to us. And this list is not uh, the, the fullness of the list of benefits that we receive. And those benefits are good. And they are good for us. But that's not why we receive those benefits. In fact, Oftentimes, what ends up happening is we come to God and we read this book. 
We read his word and the motivation of our heart is, God, make things around me better. I want to manipulate using his word to make the benefits, make my kingdom better and my glory more evident. And that is the danger of understanding that we receive benefits without understanding the purpose of those benefits. And so, so what's the purpose? Well, you will receive power, and it is for your benefit, but ultimately, it is for his glory. It's for his glory. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it, to the praise of his glory. Did you catch it? When you experience peace, it's for the praise of his glory, not the praise of your benefit. When you receive love and experience that love, it's for the praise of his glory, not your benefit. Although you receive that benefit. It's to praise God, to give him glory every time. And so, so I thought of two really key pieces. What does this mean that we'll receive power for his glory? For one, it's the transformational work that he's going to do in us for his glory. It says, you, all of us with unveiled faces, faces, beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed. Formed. You are being transformed into the image of Christ so that as you operate today on earth, you reveal Christ because of the benefits in your life for his glory. When you experience more peace and you live out more peace, the world looks at you and says, where did you get that peace? And you can say, it comes from the Father. It's for the witnessing the transformational work in me, yes, I receive benefit of it, but it is for one purpose, to be a witness of the truth that's in you. And some people, they want to experience something. And I'm here to tell you that when you begin to work with the Holy Spirit, you do experience this. Story after story of people who talk about receiving love for the first time in their life, and it was very clear this was from the Father above. And so, very clearly, why do we receive power for his glory? For gospel witness. Ultimately, that's what it's for. It's so that in the right time, when the Spirit of God is working in you and the circumstances line it up, you can proclaim the gospel. And, and, and I always am cautious about this, this idea that, yeah, um, you know, make sure your life's on display and then when necessary, use words. I think we're also called to be ready to prepare with words. Yes, our lives should look more and more like Christ. And hopefully, if you've been following for a year, that in 10 years you'll go, wow, look at how much more Christ is in me. And if you've been following for 40 years, I hope you say, look at how much more Christ is in me. And I still have more to do because until I receive the fullness of that in heaven, my job isn't done here to be a witness, to be a witness. Remember what it said in Acts 1, 8 is to the ends of the earth. That that is our goal, that is our purpose, and that is why God says it's gonna be better that Jesus comes to heaven because I'm gonna release to you my power in you. And in your weakness, my power will be made strong. So you're maybe going, this is great, I get it, I understand it, but here's the question, how do I access this power for his glory then? How do I access this power to expand his kingdom? And it's not the way that you would think. It's not the way you would think because we bring into our works-based flesh desire to do something and what you read throughout Scripture is there is no lamp to rub, no, no ritual or potion. There's only one way to access this power, and it's the same way that you did the day that you surrendered your life to Jesus. It is in full surrender. 
And this goes against my brain because I'm thinking, wait a minute, I've got to do something. And he says, no, this is a free gift that no one should boast. Jesus came and said, I will die for you. I will be the, the payment required for you. And in me, you will find life if you'll surrender to me, if you'll trust me, if you'll believe in me. And so this is just a smattering of statements, but I want you to get the picture. How do I have the fullness of this power evident in my life? How do I have maximum peace, maximum joy, maximum patience with my children who I'm discipling because I love them so much? How do I have that patience How do I have self-control in the areas of my life where I'm so tempted? How can I have maximum? I want it. I want the absolute abundance of what's in me to be living out of me for his glory. And the benefit that I receive is I have joy and life. How can I do it? Deny yourself, Jesus says. Take up your cross. Those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Die to yourself, follow me, rest in me, abide in me, walk by the Spirit, daily surrender. And that causes my brain to go, are you, what are you saying? Are you saying that, that I don't have to do anything? Well, I want to be cautious here for a moment. But in the fullness, yes, that's what I'm saying. If you, if you grab your fists for me, wherever you're at, just grab your fists, make some fists and squeeze really hard. And I want you to hold until I tell you to let go. And as you're squeezing, I want you to realize that this is what the enemy wants you to do. It wants, the enemy wants you to say, that's not enough. When Jesus said it's finished, it's not enough. It's not finished. I have to work. I have to work. I have to work and show you, God, how much I love you so I can receive the fullness of who you are. And then release your hands, because if you're like me, your hands are already tired. And this is what he says. Rest in me. If you rest in me and surrender to me, I will fill you with all the things that you actually need. The benefit to you will be, I will fill you. And in that, you will proclaim the gospel in my power, not in your wisdom. This is the goal, to learn to surrender. See, what do I, how do I do this well? Let's let's be honest. Yes, I must be feeding on the word of God. I must be feeding. How else will I know truth if I'm not reading truth? So I do feed. This This is a thing I do, but it's not a burden. It's life. I come to it and I say, oh, I'm starving. God, I'm starving for who you are. I want more of you. So I I feed on your word and I pray in the spirit. I pray with the spirit's energy and effort to align my heart to God's heart so that I hate what's evil and I cling to what's good. And I worship in the spirit because everything about it is I don't have to do this in a special way except to fully surrender and give you praise. I love others in my community because you first love me and out of me is coming love that I don't know where it's coming from. And so in the communities I'm in, I must be in relationship. And through that, I surrender to what you want to do as I'm in community and and I live generously. I open up my, my, my time, my talents, and my treasure to invest in the kingdom that I don't begrudgingly give. I say, God, look what you've done. I want your kingdom to flourish. And I know that your finances that you've blessed me with are part of that picture. So so I give and I support. I fill Operation Christmas Child boxes. I support missionaries. I give to the local church to help with this bigger vision. I live generously. And what I find out is that I will learn how to proclaim because the power in me will give me the direction to go. That's why we always talk about this bless rhythm idea, to to pray in the morning, God, what would you like to do today? Not God, I've got a list of suggestions for you. (laughs) Could we go here and do this and that? No, it's, it's it's a surrender. And so I want to tell you a true story. It's I've had a lot of encounters of my, in my walk where I have to scratch my head and go, wow, God, you've really showed up. And I, I can't explain it. The world would explain it as coincidence. 
But when you understand how God works for his kingdom and his glory, then you begin to realize that a lot of these coincidences that elevate his glory are actually him at work. And so uh, I'll confess to you, I was not doing a great job of daily morning prayer saying, God, where would you like to use me today? I was often coming with my list of requests. God, fix this, heal this person, all that stuff, feeling good. Oh, praise God, on my way to work. And this one particular morning several months ago, I just said, okay, God, I'm sorry. What would you like to do? Would you use me to proclaim the gospel? And so I came into work and I'm ready to go and I got phone calls and emails and I'm about to, to get ready to speak on a Sunday. So I've got a lot of preparation. I've been working on it, but it's like, I gotta bring it to a close, it's time. And so in that distraction, I'm getting very frustrated. It seems like I can't avoid any of the distractions around me. The phone keeps ringing, the email keeps bleeping, then the texts are coming in. And I just said, that's it, I've had it. And so I picked up my stuff and I got in the car. I told Ashley, our campus administrator, I've got to go somewhere. I need quiet. I can't concentrate. So off I went, down I-5. And I'm driving, and I remember I was just going, where am I going? I don't even have a destination in mind. I have no clue. And so I pull into Amaker Park, and if you know that location, in the back of it, there's a gazebo area, kind of a little park area. And so I pulled in. I thought, fantastic, nobody's here. So I grab my stuff, gorgeous day. There's salmon in the river, and I'm sitting there, and I've got the Bible out and my, my work that I've been kind of preparing, the computer's ready, and I'm in prayer time. Okay, God, I'm ready. Let's, let's what do you want me to share? <clears throat> and a car pulls up. And I look over at the car, and I'm like, ah, oh, man, I kind of wanted to be alone, but Whatever, let's get back to work. So I'm concentrating, the door's open, and two guys come walking right next to me. And, and of course, I'm not gonna ignore them. I just sort of in my, hey, nice to see you moment. And uh, we'll refer to them as Pistol Pete because he had a gun on his hip, and then his buddy, I don't know what his name is, we'll just call him Joe. So Pistol Pete and Joe come by, and, I, and of course, I said, hey, how are you doing? They said, oh, looks like you're reading the Bible. What are you doing? I said, oh, just preparing a message, you know, I'm with family church, and, and I'm gonna be speaking here on Sunday. And they, ah, good for you. And they walked on and I thought, okay, whew, excellent, back to work. So I have back to work and I'm studying, I'm praying, I'm thinking, I'm writing. And then Pistol Pete comes back over and takes a seat. <laughs> you ever have those moments where you thought, man, I really need to get this done. Now remember in the morning I prayed, God used me today to proclaim the gospel. And now I'm in the middle of an opportunity. And of course, I'm so focused on what I've got to accomplish, the task at hand that God says, here we go. And so Pistol Pete sits down and Joe, his buddy, walks off to the gazebo and he's hanging out in the gazebo. And this guy starts to unpack his life to me and tells me about how he's going to shake his fist at God and he's going to have a face-to-face -face someday because this guy's living in his car. And he's just on and on and it goes on for like 20 minutes and I can't get a word in. There is, has not been a breath given. And I'm like, what are you doing, God? What is going on here? And it was like this moment where God said, Craig, why don't you shut up and listen? <laughs> yeah, that's good advice. I think that was the L of the blessed rhythm. Why don't you try listening? And I was like, oh yeah, that is what we're supposed to be doing. So I began to listen. And then it was as if God said, now watch. Watch what I'm gonna do. And so Joe, his buddy, comes back. And Joe sits down at the table. Of course, now I'm, I'm pretty engrossed in what's going on. I am focused. I am listening. And I actually begin to pray a little bit for this guy. But Joe comes down, and he starts to proclaim the gospel. I can't explain this. I don't know if Joe is a follower. But he starts to talk to his friend in a powerful, clear gospel way. He says, you need Jesus. You keep talking about how you want to control God, and God's in control, and he's out of there. But you need Jesus. And, he, and then there's this moment. He looks at me, this Joe, and he points, and he says, why do you think God brought this guy here today? And I'm just, I haven't said anything, by the way. He goes, he came. He brought him so you could hear this. And I am stunned. I have nothing to give. I'm not the one doing the teaching. I'm just there as, as I guess, the vessel that became the launch pad for a gospel presentation. And so this went on for about 10 minutes. 
And they kind of went back and forth and I interjected a few questions and, and kind of gave a perspective. And then uh, Joe and Pistol Pete got up and said goodbye and they went over to the gazebo. And by that time I looked at my clock, I'm 20 minutes late to a meeting, got in the car and I drove off. And while I was driving away, it was like God said, did you see what I did? You see, that to me is what I think you must understand. That When you're surrendered to what the Spirit wants to do, oftentimes you cannot plan for it or prepare for it, but he was ready, the Spirit in me. I hope that you live your life in a way where you can encounter and experience God doing great things. And you know who didn't get glory that day? It wasn't me. And it wasn't Joe in this scenario. It was God. It wasn't about my kingdom. It was about his kingdom. It wasn't for my glory. So I could tell you a story and say, and then I shared the gospel and he came to Jesus and he went right to the, to the river and got baptized. Well, that'd be a cool story. But I share this with you because I think what the picture is, is in full surrender, what you find is that God will do things through you for his glory and you will receive the benefit. And today, the benefit for me is I got to be a part of it. I got to see it happen. I got to, to witness the power of the Spirit at work. So I want to close here for the Ephesians, Ephesians 3.20. It says this, Now to him, the Father, him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think, according to the power at work within us, the Holy Spirit, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all the generations forever and ever. Amen. I want to remind you that all generations start in our homes. And so may God receive glory in your home and may you live out well so that your children can see who God is by what he's doing in you. And may he receive all the glory for all generations to come. I love you guys. I'm going to release to the campuses. I hope that you've enjoyed pressing into the Holy Spirit. And now may you live this out for the days and years to come. Love you guys. See you later. It's a powerful moment when we begin to really realize that all the work I do to somehow manipulate the Holy Spirit is not the way in which we encounter God. It's always in surrender. And what I want to challenge you to is that blessed rhythm. I want to see you live out a life that is making kingdom impact. And so for our transformational moment, we're going to bring you back one more time to the blessed rhythm. Begin your day in prayer. God, what would you like to do for your kingdom? Father in heaven, your kingdom come. Your will be done. And God, would you use me? for that. And two, of course, listening, we keep saying, don't forget, it's about listening to the Spirit. But would you please, as you talk with people and encounter them, just listen. Listen to what's going on in their lives. Be, be a voice of ears more than a voice of speech right off the bat. And of course, the eating is really a, it's just a platform from relationship. A cup of coffee, espresso, full meal, whatever it is to build enough relationship that you get enough together where you can serve one another. Let people serve you, serve them as well. But the most important one is the sharing. Well, how do I say most important? Every one of them is important. But the sharing, again, is that's the role of the Spirit. So if you want to be effective witness, learn to hear the Spirit. Learn to walk with the Spirit and then see what God would do. And when the time is right to share, the Spirit will be with you. The Spirit will guide you. And sometimes, like me, you'll just be a spectator and watching the Spirit work. I love you guys. I hope that you are inspired today and encouraged and challenged. May God be with you as you go forward. Love you guys. See you next week.